good. All right. Well, I'm uh, wanting to thank you for coming here to this talk today by Chris Winslow. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about Chris before I um, turn it over to him. So Chris got his uh, Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Biology from Ohio University. He then did two graduate degrees, a Master's of Science and a PhD in Limnology and Aquatic Sciences at Bowling Green State University. Uh, after that, he was an instructor at Bowling Green um, for about seven years and then took an assistant professorship at Kurtztown University of Pennsylvania. Um, after that, he, or it looked like simultaneous to that, uh, he took over as um, assistant director of Ohio Sea Grant and Ohio State University's uh, Stone Lab. Uh, and as of roughly one and a half, two years ago, they promoted him to full director of the Stone Lab and Ohio Sea Grant at the same time, and that's his current position. Uh, Chris has a, a wide variety of, of research interests. Uh, during his graduate work, he focused mostly, mostly on interactions between various types of fishes, uh, largemouth, smallmouth bass, as well as between bass and invasive species, trying to think through what the impacts of the invasive goby might be. Um, he currently uh, is involved in impact of invasive species, harmful algal blooms, no nutrient loading, uh, and its impacts on eutrophication and hypoxia, the impacts of dredging activities, uh, and so on. He's, he's very rich and very deep in his service to the Great Lakes. Uh, he currently serves as co-director of the Lake Erie Millennium Network, a committee member of Annex 2, Annex 4 of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. He's on the International Joint Commission's Research Coordinating Committee at Science Advisory Board, uh, the Blue Accounting Network of the Great Lakes Commission, and I could probably add 10 more to that, one of the most active players in the Great Lakes. So we're really fortunate to have him here. Uh, Ohio State University and the Stone Lab are one of the most recent university partners for the Cooperative Institute of Limnology and Ecosystem Research. They joined us in our most recent bid for the next Cooperative Institute. Uh, and so it's really a pleasure for me to welcome Chris as one of our uh, university partners. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Is that microphone picking up okay? Can we hear we're good? All right, great. Brad, thanks for that introduction. I'm excited. Uh, I've already had some great meetings this morning, and, and for the rest of the day after this talk, I'll be talking with some Tyler and, and Noah Glero folks. I'm really excited to be here. This is, this is great. Um, as far as this talk, it's, it's going to be very data light. Um, but you'll see, basically, uh, we're managing a lot of grant dollars right now and a lot of grant research effort, um, in, in primarily Lake Erie because we're the Ohio Sea Grant College Program. So I really want to just give you kind of a taste of some of the projects that are going out there, um, kind of the, the focus areas that, that they're concentrated on, and then provide you uh, with some information on, on the breadth of those grants. And if you want to know any more detail about it, I can give you um, files that show you, the, you know, the title of the project, but also the objectives of every one of these projects, the key primary investigator to reach out to, the key institution doing the work. So at any point in time, and if you have a question about a specific research project, you know, I, I know a, a, a fair bit about it, but I'm not going to be able to drill down into a lot of the heavy details. But I can clearly put you in contact with the lead PI on, on those efforts. And so that's where um, we're going to kind of go. And if, if time permits, uh, I also have some, some um, photos, really, just of, of Stone Laboratory. Because I think, as Brad mentioned, with um, recently added as is a, is a, is an active member of the, of the current Cooperative Institute proposal, we're hoping that Stone Lab becomes a resource uh, for everybody in the region to use to address some of the issues that are going on. So just what I refer to as some eye candy photos, just to show you kind of the facilities and the equipment that exists there that we'd, we'd love for people to be coming up and, and utilizing. Uh, so this is the sign that actually sits out in front of uh, the research facility. And I put it here because um, Stone Lad is, is actually an OSU-owned entity. So the, the island itself, we've got units on South Bass that I'll show you pictures of, and also uh, Gibraltar Island, which is a six and a half acre island. It's owned by, by the university. So um, some of my budget, my, my funding base comes from Ohio State University through the Office of Research, but also through the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the workings of OSU, that's where OSU's extension resides, is within that college. So I report to two vice presidents. Um, this is the mission of both the lab and of Sea Grant programs. It's really one of research, education, and outreach. So today I'm going to highlight a lot on that research that we're, that we're helping manage, um, some of the research that, that our staff are actually engaged in also, and I see a lot of co-PIs um, in the room on some of those, those grants. Um, so the research is critically important, um, but as we all know in this, this room too, is if, if that is just becoming a published article and just going to be presented at a regional conference, um, 
it doesn't have enough legs, in, in, in my opinion. And so we need to make sure that we get that information into the hand of the, the agencies that, that can use that information, but also into um, our college curriculum, and even at the K through, through 12 layer. Um, so that education and outreach, in, in, in our view, really goes hand in hand with the, the research that we, that we watch. And then as was mentioned, Sea Grant. So yeah, I'm, I'm the director of the Sea Grant program, but also the director of, of the Stone Lab facility. Again, both have the same mission. Um, one, of course, is a, is a NOAA funding line, and the other one, um, as you'll see on the next slide, comes from various places. Um, so that's what this is. You know, what is uh, Ohio Sea Grant? So the, the first bullet really tells you it is like hopefully anyone's retirement portfolio that sits there. You try and diversify the funding stream. And so that's what Sea Grant and Stone Lab have been working to do. So some of our money comes from NOAA um, through the National Sea Grant College Program and then trickles down to the states that have those programs. Um, we get funding, again, as I mentioned, from OSU, Office of Research, and the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences. We have staff um, that are writing grants regularly. Um, so we, we have historically benefited from GLRI funding that exists out there, um, but also numerous other lines of funding. We do have a, a state line item. Um, I just testified um, at the state capitol um, in mid-February to talk about our state line item. So we do or have historically gotten some state line um, funds from the, from the governor's budget. And then we have donor support. Um, because it is an island in an area of, of, of Lake Erie that is very popular to tourists, um, they care about a healthy lake. And so often those individuals donate to programs like Stone Lab and Sea Grant to help our efforts in, in, in cleaning up that ecosystem. As I did mention, we're one of 33 programs. So every program that bumps into the Atlantic, Pacific, Gulf, or the Great Lakes has a Sea Grant program. Um, I see one of those Sea Grant directors in the audience here actually today. Um, mission of research, education, outreach I've already touched on. We do have a NOAA strategic plan that guides us. So from the National Sea Grant Program Office, it comes down to us. But just in very general terms, this is kind of the space that we're working in. So things that have to do with resilient communities and economies. So going into local communities and figuring out how can we help them deal with things like Superstorm Sandy or these increased prevalence of storm events and the size of these storm events. Um, but also going into these communities and talking about how do we help fix up marinas and how do we increase charter captain visits or how do we keep our beaches safe. And so really working on projects that also increase community resilience and economy. Sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. Um, we're trying to ramp up our ability to do aquaculture in Ohio specifically, but we work closely with the Department of Natural Resources um, fisheries units to really talk about um, educating anglers, putting on charter captors conferences, and, and doing research that looks, looks into sustainable fisheries. Um, healthy coastal ecosystems is what I would argue is, is the broadest of these focus areas that come down from the National Strategic Plan. But this is where you find things like you know, the impacts of dredging or pharmaceuticals and personal care products, um, those sorts of things, uh, uh, coal tar sands and, and things like that. Uh, how do we deal with those? And then four kind of goes with that idea of education and outreach, this, this idea of environmental literacy and workforce development. Um, so for the last four years, I, I believe, we've been offering a um, – a harmful algal bloom workshop, and we're seeing a lot of our water treatment plant operators come and take that workshop so that they can better identify um, the algal communities that are being pulled into their plants. Um, we also have a cyanobacteria and algal um, odor workshop. Um, so usually we see about 80 people come through those two different workshops annually to really learn about how to better operate their water treatment facilities. Um, so I want to highlight some of the HABs stuff that's going on in, in the essential role that, that I believe a Sea Grant program has, has been able to play in this. And, and what we can really show is that we've got some critical linkages that currently exist, and we're hoping to build on these. And one of the great examples is, is the Cooperative Institute, so, so Siler. Um, but we played a critical role in the HABs NOAA forecast. So for the last eight or nine years, um, in early July, Rick Stump and others come out to uh, Stone Laboratory and give their annual forecast for, for the lake. So we've been happy to play a role in, in the outreach that's associated with that. Um, we interact quite regularly with our state agencies. Um, we have what's called the Lake Erie Commission, and this is the directors of all these agencies that are highlighted here on the slide. EPA, DNR, Health, um, Ag, but also Transportation. Ohio Department of Transportation sits on there. And so really the idea of um, quarterly, we are called to these meetings um, and give a, give a report on behalf of Sea Grant and Stone Lab on, on the efforts that we're doing and, and, and offer assistance in any way we can for these state agencies. Um, as was mentioned by Brad early on, I'm a member of IJC's Science Advisory Board, specifically the Research Coordinating Committee. So really sitting down <clears throat> with individuals from the U.S. side of the Great Lakes and the Canadian side of the Great Lakes and talking about what are some of the priorities that, that we should be addressing going in, into the future. 
A uh, great relationship with the governor's office. As I mentioned, we have a state line item through there, so there's a lot of communication going on between Sea Grant programs related to harmful algal blooms, other issues, but right now the heavy one on our radar is harmful algal blooms and, and how, how we can address that. Um, often interacting with both the state and federal legislators. I was just on the Hill um, March 9th, so two weeks ago, um, talking about the, the, the program and the benefit, again, not only just from a research component side of it, but again, that coastal resilience, building economies in those regions that we work. Uh, we work closely with our NARES, so ours is Old Woman Creek, um, and, and so we have a great relationship with Old Woman Creek. We recently started uh, efforts on a new consortium. Um, we, we, we received some NSF funding, so Sea Grant um, took the lead and wrote an NSF grant to get funding to build what we're calling LEARN. Um, LEARN stands for Lake Erie Area Research Network. Um, we've had two meetings to date. Bylaws are being crafted. They're actually in review right now for, for potential members to vote on. We've developed committees that will work underneath this, uh, this network of, of groups. And it's very much like what, what Siler is, is aiming to be. And, and for us, it's um, making sure that all the academic institutions in Ohio that bump into Lake Erie know the assets that reside at each one of those universities. So every year we'll have an annual meeting that has a, uh, a new science um, or new researcher event at it to bring those people that have maybe only been in the system for three or five years to make sure they're at the table talking about the work they're doing or, or their sweet spot. Even to the point where we've got a calendar, the website should be going live here within a week or two, a calendar that lists where all the vessels are at any point in time on the water. So if University of Toledo knows they're going to be out in this part of Western Basin, it's on the calendar. So other researchers can say, hey, can I send a master's student with you, or can you grab a sample of this type for me? So really trying to make sure that we're linking up and communicating where vessels are on the system. Um, we will be bringing this, this LEARN consortium into Michigan and talking to the, the Siler folks and to talking to other universities. Um, when I sat down and talked to my administration about building this consortium, writing this NSF grant, when we pitched the idea, they were like, well, why isn't this going... Great Lakes wide, and we said because sometimes it's hard enough to get a small <laughs> network going. If you go too big too quick, you kind of trip on yourselves. And so the idea is to get this into place, make sure that the communication works, make sure we're meeting the needs of the members, and then quickly we hope that this expands beyond Ohio. Um, and so we'll be working on, on that. And then as, as it's mentioned here, you know, we've always had a great working relationship with Noah Aguero and, and with Siler, and, and so we, we look forward to um, future years to really build the strength of that, of that relationship. Just wanted to show you this extension component before I get into the research in a little bit more detail. Just to show you some numbers for us, this is approximately what we see annually. Um, so this is, you know, coupling that research and outreach. So P through 12 educators, so 440 educators were reached last um, year for us, and that's touching about 28,000 students directly. Um, as far as Sea Grant sponsored or organized events, we hosted about 315 last year, and those are the attendees, about 2,600 at that. And as far as public and professional presentations between myself and, and the rest of the staff, just over 800, reaching about 45,000 attendees. And when we report on this and we have our agents report on this, we actually know of those 45,000 how many were agency folks versus academics versus teachers versus elected officials. So we can really make measures on who we're reaching um, as far as an audience. Um, so OSG, I would, I would clearly argue that we're one of the leaders. It's not just the only leader, but one of the leaders in this space and helping to manage funds and, and, and to get the word out. And again, I think Noah Glarell and, and, and Siler and the other Great Lakes uh, state programs, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, New York, Pennsylvania, we're all in our respective states seen as, as leaders in this, this network. Um, so when we disseminate this research, just to again cap out on this, this extension side of things, we definitely have some groups that we concentrate on. And this is just kind of general groups um, that are often up to the island every year. So we see farmers groups coming to us from Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio. The Farm Bureau is up regularly. We annually have an event for decision makers um, where we actually bring mayors, mayors, county commissioners, decision makers up to the island. And same thing I'm going to do to you, give overviews or highlights of the research that's going on so they're aware of what's, what's happening in their own backyard. Science Writers Conference. We have a two-day conference. We bring the science writers up to us, and I survey them before they arrive and say, what do you wish you knew more about in Lake Erie that you would report on? And so about 50% of the agenda is geared towards those researchers. So I bring researchers, and they present to the media. And then the other 50% of the slots I reserve for us to present things that the media probably doesn't even know is going on, right? And so that's a two-day event. We probably usher about 18 different researchers in front of that audience to really educate them on the issues and the lake. Um, charter captains come up all the time, small businesses, tourism sectors up there all the time. 
And then again, we offer courses up there. So we definitely have about 200 students, around 20 courses and 10 workshops uh, where we really immerse students into the, into the class. So let's get into the meat of the, the research side of this thing. And when I say meat, again, this is going to be a lot of projects that I'm going to kind of scratch the surface on. But I just wanted to make sure that, that everybody here and, and that was listening virtually knew of the stuff that's in play right now. So we have approximately 55, 56 projects in play right now. Uh, the first funding source for this was from OSU's College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences. F2F stands for Field to Faucet, is what that initiative was named. So basically, quickly after the uh, Toledo Drinking Water Advisory um, in 2014, the, the dean of this college basically came forward and said, we need to show that we're moving the needle on this HABS issue. So he went into his operating budget, pulled out a million dollars, and basically went through in discussions with staff and faculty at OSU what projects should be funded. And that's the projects um, I'll show you on the next, uh, on the upcoming slide. But basically this infographic or this image on the bottom really shows this idea of going from the field all the way to the faucet with that water treatment plant. There's five projects in there. I'm going to highlight a couple of them for you real quickly. I won't go into great detail on any one of them. Um, with that, um, the dean of that college was very smart about finding those funds. Because not only did he allocate the million, he went down to the state capital and said, this is what OSU is trying to invest in this problem. What can the state do? And quickly, the Ohio Department of Higher Education, the ODHE, stepped up and put $2 million into play. So there are 18 projects that are wrapping up. They'll be done by the end of June here. Um, and a final report will come out on those. And I'll be happy to share that with all of you. Um, but 18 projects are ongoing right now. And while these two sets, the, the 23 projects you're looking at here, we're moving on, we were reporting back to the Ohio Department of Higher Education on the work we're doing. And they actually put another $2 million in play. These just started. They're about a, you know, three quarters of the way through their first year. But just to show you, when we put these calls out for proposals, even though OSU in, in help with, I should have gone back, in help with University of Toledo and Heidelberg University, have really been helping manage these projects. So even though the money is running through OSU and through the Sea Grant program, this is clearly a collaborative effort. Um, and it wouldn't be done without many universities coming to the table. And in round two, um, there's 14 projects currently funded under this. This just shows you the universities in this table, those that submitted grants for this work for this uh, RFP, and the first number is those that were funded. So you can see there's a good spread across uh, a handful of those universities here in Ohio. And then because we are a Sea Grant program, we have money that runs through our shop also. Um, and so, oh, this is to remind me. So in the first round, when we went through the Ohio Department of Higher Education, the way it happened is, is um, we called all the researchers that work in this water space across the state. We all went to Heidelberg University, and we set up basically focus areas or unanswered realms of questions that we need to address. And the scientists self-selected which focus area they should be in. And these 18 projects came from just open deliberation with PIs sitting across the table with each other, deciding what should be done, who has the expertise to do it, who should be PI, who should be co-PI. For the second round, the ODHE round two, the 14 projects, that went through a formal RFP process. We actually went out to the agencies and said, okay, EPA, what do you need to know to be able to address HABs? Ag, what do you need to know to address HABs? Health, so on and so forth. And so the RFP went out with actual priorities from those state agencies driving that second set of two million. We received 50 projects at just under, or just over four point, or $5.7 million. That was at the pre-proposal stage. We down-selected to 19, that we're still asking for more than we had to give out, 2.7 million-ish. And then the table at the right is what we ended up funding. So 14 of those 19s actually, actually went forward. And again, because uh, we're a Sea Grant program, we have our own pool of money that comes from NOAA through us, again, the National Sea Grant Program. We give out about $500,000 every year. Um, so over a course of four years, we have about $1.8 million in play now. Um, the first set of nine projects, you see nine plus nine, the first set of nine are in one-year no-cost extensions, and the second set of nine have been in play for about a year plus. Um, so those are all in play still currently going. Um, and I'd love to mention this, if you add it up, it's about $6.8 million, but there's about $5 million in here in match. Um, and so that's critically important to, to show. A lot of these universities are not only coming with their expertise, but they're coming with matching dollars. These are some of the partners, partners for the field of faucet. So you'll see there's federal partners here in the USDA and NSF, um, but there's universities, there's state agencies. So this has clearly been a, a collaborative effort to come up with these projects, those five projects. Um, here they are. I know you can't see this from where you're at, but what I wanted to emphasize with this is just send me an email. This is an Excel sheet. It has the project title, 
the field to faucet funds they got, the lead PI, their affiliation, and the column I've cut off is the objectives. So if you read a title of that and you want to know what answers are coming out of that, I can give you the objectives of every one of these five projects. Okay, and these PIs know that they should be ready to field questions from people that have questions. So here are those projects, and I'm going to run through them. One of them is an integrated system for NNP removal. So we're funding a project where you have a semi-truck that has um, a series of centrifuges and lime or gypsum addition, and as the manure is pumped from a lagoon, um, you're actually able to separate the water so that at the end, the mass volume coming through this operation is less than one milligram per liter phosphorus. So that large volume that used to be a problem to ship out of that distressed watershed, that water can now be applied without ramping up soil concentrations and solid phosphorus cakes are reserved on the back end. So we have these solid transportable um, cakes that can go out of those distra distressed watersheds. And this is still finishing up its project. Right now they've been working on biodigester material rather than manure and they're ramping up right now and have for the last couple months to actually put it onto a manure coming from the lagoon. We have a, a nutrient management app. So this is a, being done by Dr. John Fulton at OSU. Basically, it's for farmers to use um, to, to, to record things that they're doing on their fields. This is different from a Ohio Farm Bureau Federation app that really is just making sure those farmers in Ohio are 4R compliant. We have a Senate bill in Ohio that requires them to, again, not apply fertilizer when the ground is frozen or when rain is in the forecast. This app is really to be storing things like you know, crop rotation, when they applied fertilizer, what yield they got from what part of their field, so that they can really track um, continuous improvement of their planning and their management of nutrients. So that's a second project. Another one is the development of the geospatial warehouse. So basically developing access protocols and, and getting all the lawyers in a room to figure out how can we share data without violating anything and some of those heavy discussions you have to have. But basically they're aggregating um, database layers that, that are available to the general public, and they're hoping to add hydrologic and weather and agricultural production data as we move forward. So basically what we're trying to do is, is make sure that all the data being collected by farmers in Ohio is in one data repository that can be accessible to other farmers, agribusinesses, but also researchers. And discussions are going on right now to talk with the Agricultural Data Cooperative and some remote sensing to see if we can get, for example, Ohio View, if we can get that data wrapped into this cooperative. Um, detection of cyanotoxins using UAVs. So we've got cameras out there on drones right now. Um, we've been able to look at the optical images coming from these to contrast the water colors that are coming back from these. And actually these are now outfitted with water collection devices. So the drone can go out, take an image of the water, but also collect a water sample to bring back for analysis. So you can correlate the image with the, the water sample. A uh, real-time microsystem that's going on right now, if you've not heard of a BioFET sensor. So basically Dr. Wu Lu, also at Ohio State University. Um, basically, he's got antibodies that he's adhered to a gel. Um, you can measure the electrical charge across that gel. And when you expose that um, gel to microcystins, as they bind to the antibodies, it changes that electrical current across the gel. And so basically, we're looking at within five minutes, you would have the ability to determine the concentration of the water. This is different from water treatment plants now. that Many of them are, are using ELISA. And basically, the response from that comes back in four, six hours. And by that time, a lot of that water has come in and out of the water treatment facility, and they don't know. So now they should be able to adjust the treatment procedures based on the level of toxin that's coming, coming into the facility. Um, 2 to 3K, what I'm saying here is the, the university is currently developing the, the, basically the ability to sell or produce these and send them out. On early numbers, I'm hearing anywhere from two to $3,000 for the device that reads um, the chips. And if mass produced, the chips themselves will only be about two to three bucks a pop. And so the idea is for this to be something that you could measure the toxin levels on the intake and also throughout the treatment train to know how you're doing as far as uh, treating that water, the toxin. I put this up because this is this, uh, the modeling, ensemble modeling effort that went out talking about um, where are the quote unquote hot spots identified for TP and DRP. Um, but I use this to remind me is that this is great modeling effort, fantastic work that's being done here, but on a, on a finer scale, we're still missing some detail within these on whether that dissolved reactive phosphorus is coming from organic fertilizers or is it coming from manure source or is it coming from wastewater treatment plants. So right now we have underneath the field of faucet again this ability to do source tracking. We call this phosphorus fingerprinting. I always have to stress that fingerprinting because people keep saying it's finger pointing. That's not the effort here on this exercise. It's fingerprinting. But what we basically had is researchers at Heidelberg and at OSU, Dr. Paula Mauser, really looking to take things like chicken, hog, 
um, cattle um, waste, um, agricultural row crops that are commercial fertilizers, wastewater treatment plants, and finding out if we can find a molecular signature. There is isotopic work already going on in this space, but this is molecular. So basically, they're trying to figure out, can we not only take that phosphorus sample, but can we actually determine where that organic P came from? Um, early data shows that the molecular weights of the phosphorus compounds associated with each one of those actually show that they have the ability to distinguish between the source. Not only is it manure versus wastewater treatment plants, but is it chicken, hog, or cattle? And so really getting an idea, once you find these areas that are loading a lot of dissolved reactive phosphorus, actually finding an indication of the source. So I want to switch from the F2F and move into this idea of the ODHE projects. And I've, I've already highlighted this a little bit. For round one, we, we identified focused areas. So we had these general themes, which are here. We want to know where the bloom is, where it's moving to, and an indication of its toxic level. We also want to be able to produce safe drinking water. So what tools and technologies can we get into water treatment facilities in order to remove those toxins effectively, but also cost effectively? Um, protect human health. There are some things we don't know as far as how these toxins affect the human body or even animals. And then the last focus area was this idea of educate and engage. So figuring out um, what can we tell farmers to be doing on their landscape to help reduce phosphorus runoff. And so that, again, was we picked the focus areas, set them in different rooms at Heidelberg University, and the 80 scientists that were invited basically picked where they wanted to go. And when in that focus area room, they talked amongst each other to figure out who would do what and how much money they would need to do what they wanted to do. So that's how the first round went. Went really well. It was actually um, very exciting to see, very uh, collegial discussions, and, and, and coming to the, the conclusions on which projects should be funded was, was fun to watch. But after doing that, um, what happened is we, we set these 18 projects in play. We set up an advisory board over the top of these projects that was made up of all the state agencies. And as we went through that, we appreciated the work that was done. Great things are happening. But we thought if the second round of funding came through, why don't we, rather than put the agency advisory board on top of these projects after they've been self-selected, why don't we let those agencies also drive it? So that's when we did the call for priorities. These were the way the priorities came back to us treatment optimization, so on and so forth. But you can see that treatment optimization layers within producing safe drinking water. Cyanotoxin toxicity research falls within the sources and blooms. Reservoir management is safe drinking water. Bloom dynamics. So you can see that the priorities, when the agencies were asked to give us their priorities, they mapped very well on the original four focus areas. So we felt confident that the work that we were funding in the first round was spot on. And this is just showing you some of the Universities that have funding under this, either as a lead PI or as a co-PI. There are more names here than were on that table for round two. So some of these universities are getting round one money, some are getting round two money, some are getting both rounds. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go through this top focus area thing, this produce bloom, or the, the four focus areas, blooms, safe drinking water, public health, and educate and engage, and just pick out some highlight projects to give you some information on what was going on in, in each one of those focus areas. Don't expect you to be able to read this. What I'm showing you here is that all 18 projects are listed. They're categorized by their focus area on the far left. The money they got from ODHE is in the ODHE funds column. What they brought to the table is match. The lead PI and the lead institution are here. The next column on the sheet, if you want access to it, has all the objectives of every single one of these projects. Okay? Additionally, we put out a report every year as a requirement for ODHE. There is one out for 2015. Um, the next one will be out by close to the middle of June. It has introduction, some background information, defines those focus areas for you. And then each one, each focus area has an infographic page. Appendix 1 lists all the partners and who's on the agency advisory board, who, who was there as far as the university. And Appendix 2, each of the 18 projects has a one-pager dedicated to it. It gives you a summary of what was accomplished, what was the bottom line, take-home message. So this is being generated again, and it will be available here, as I said, in, in, in June. So let's go into these. So this is the first one is track blooms from source. Um, this is that spotlight. One of these is coming out, the lead PIs on this. Again, there's more on these projects than those I've listed here. So I don't mean to insult anybody, but there's often many times many co-PIs and PIs on these. One is an early warning system for Lake Erie algal bloom. So one of those was to put a buoy, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, just outside Sandusky's, the city of Sandusky's water treatment plant. Um, we saw some great um, data come back from this back in 2015 in July. It was a rapid increase in chlorophyll, um, and so we were able to warn that water treatment facility that the bloom was coming. 
And this has also led to partnerships with NASA where they're actually putting hyperspectral imaging devices on the bottom of aircraft. So when our satellites aren't giving enough information, whether because it's a cloud cover or what the case may be, we can actually go out on, on a uh, kind of as-needed basis to get finer resolution using these NASA flights. Um, we got also within track blooms from source to spotlights, we have best strategies to reduce phosphorus loads from agricultural watersheds. So Laura Johnson basically is going to the sub-watershed scale. Um, as we go towards 40% reduction by 2020, the concern is, is that we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll be putting a lot of efforts on the ground, um, but you, if you measure the concentration maybe at the mouth of the Maumee, you're not seeing a measurable decrease. And so really what we want to do is march up into those sub-watersheds, in the case here, Honey Creek and Rock Creek, and actually be able to correlate the amount of BMPs that are happening in that small watershed with a measurable reduction at a certain location. And so Laura Johnson's leading that effort um, under that grant. So we're trying to match those BMPs um, with an actual load reduction at that small watershed level. Um, within the public health spotlights, um, one that's being um, funded is with Dr. Uh, Ludson and Ji Young Lee. Uh, fish, fish flesh and produce, are they storing toxins? So really what they've been going out is harvesting fish that have been in these, uh, these blooms, taking fillets, and actually looking at them for concentrations of, of toxins. Preliminary data coming from the fish flesh stuff is showing that um, they are storing some toxins, but they're at levels that are so low that if you're following the already set fish consumption advisories within the lake, it's safe to eat from a toxin microsystem standpoint. Um, from the fresh produce, the one we wanted to know is can toxins travel through irrigation systems and impact the produce. So they were looking at a suite of organ or growth, lettuce, tomatoes, carrots, peas were even added to this, and they measured what's the difference between measuring them with toxin-laden water from the surface or like a drip irrigation underground, and basically all three were showing levels of microcystin in the tissue. Um, the concentration depended on the irrigation method and the vegetable, so there was no trend overall. Um, but what we look at with these, this is never meant to be released as a startling what this is meant to be released as is an inform informative. Many of the crops in that region of the state aren't actually irrigated, right? So this is a small percentage of the crops. So that's number one. And number two, what this just tells you is that you should be testing that surface water if you're going to water with it to make sure the toxins are. So we, we always look at these results as not a gloom and doom scenario, but this is a tool in the toolbox for those farmers to be able to move forward as they're working on watering. So we can adjust the watering method. Um, and then the last one you're seeing there, we also saw not only toxin storage, but it, it reduced the growth of these crops across the board. So when toxins were in the water, the growth was slowed. Um, one of the other ones in this Protect Human Health is a me method for developing toxins. So as we know, once we ingest microcystin or whatever route it gets into the body, it's going to be metabolized into something that isn't microcystin, right? And so we've got to be able to figure out ways to even detect whether somebody's been exposed through blood samples or through urine samples. So what they've been actually using is state-of-the-art mass spec stuff to be able to detect at the part per billion level whether an individual has even been ex exposed. Um, where am I at here? Uh, protect human health, okay. Um, so some other ones within there that I can hit on real quickly without going to the other side. Some of the other ones are things like we, we don't know if this is a carcinogen yet or not. You know, we know it's a hepatotoxin, we know that impact. But we don't know will these last with prolonged exposure to you know, cancer. Um, and so a lot of that kind of work is going on going on also. Produce safe drinking water. So this is the one where we think about this. I think the general public think that a water treatment facility is a water treatment facility is a water treatment facility. But we know that at least across Ohio, and I think it's the case for most states, is that depending on the size of the community, that's what that water treatment plant looks like. And depending on how old was it. Was it built 30 years ago or was it built 15 years ago? So those capacities of those water treatment plants are very different. And so we need to put research into the fact that how do we treat these toxins, given that the infrastructure that exists in these communities are very different. Um, so we're using things like advanced oxidation, um, so looking how can we lower the chemical and energy consumption needs. So comparing what is it to do UV and chlorine versus um, acid, iron, and persulfate versus radiation and iron and, and hydrogen peroxide. So it's a whole suite of different combinations, including membrane development, to really get at this idea of, based on what your treatment plant has now and its capacity to change, what is the best and most effective way for you to be treating these toxins? Um, so far, we're seeing that we can efficiently degrade in both pure and natural waters. And we see that when you increase ionic strength, um, basically the rate of destructions um, will change. Um, in this, we're also using uh, phages. 
Um, this is Ji Yong Lee doing some of this work again. We know that microsystems are not you know, new to lakes, Lake Erie specifically. They've been around for millions of years. And so there are natural phages, so viruses of these cyanobacteria that exist. So we're actually going out and finding these different phages and bringing them into the lab and seeing if we can use those to prevent bloom formation. So can you go to smaller reservoirs and actually seed it with phage to see if they can actually degrade the cyanobacteria? So we have isolated those and we're looking at some of them, their ability to infect cyanobacteria. And then also water treatment alternatives to remove um, LR. So we're doing things like ozonation, and as I mentioned, biofiltration or membrane filtration. And we're seeing that ozone's been pretty successful so far at the level that these projects are in right now. Last one is uh, two examples in this engaged stakeholder spotlight. So one of them is this idea of actually going out with farmers. And this is a, a, a Dr. Greg Labarge who works with OSU Extension. He's gone out to 56 farmers. We're at about 80 fields right now and really assessing the impacts of changing their crop rotation, how they irrigate, how they manage their soil to really understand things like how do farming practices, climate and soil type impact nutrient runoff. Um, so this data is being collected. Really, it's trying to figure out how do we recommend a BMP for one farmer versus another farmer. So if you're in one part of the state that has this slope and this soil type, what BMP would be recommended there? versus moving 50 miles east where those things change. And so really taking uh, information from these farmers and correlating it to the runoff we're getting from fields to educate BMP placement. And the last one is this stakeholder informed decision maker. And this was out of UT, Dr. Patrick Lawrence, really basically making a decision making tool. So he's basically got a management system. So he's basically drawing from published studies, scientific literature, and where available, posting this all in one stop shop website. So you can actually go to this website. It, it should be going active here in a little bit. And it's going to be able for you to search for existing literature that exists there or different things that different communities are doing to respond to HABs and nutrient runoff. So really, it's a HABs nutrient loading um, one-stop shop uh, decision-making support tool. This is round two. Um, so there's 14 projects listed here. I'm not going to go into any of these today because, as I mentioned, these are only about um, six months in, seven months in. So really, they've just kind of ordered equipment. They have their sampling calendars set. They're hiring on grad students. But the titles of all these here are listed. I'm sorry I didn't sort them by focus area for you. But again, funds they're getting from ODHE, they're matched, the PI lead, and the university lead. So any of these that you want to know more about, uh, you can look at the objectives, and then I can put you in contact with that researcher or Google them on your Love to see the fact that what they're being allocated, again, here's a 1.87 million, but they're coming to the table with more match than they're actually receiving. And a lot of those names should look familiar to you, and, and of course, those universities are clearly going to stand out. This is uh, Sea Grants projects. So again, as I mentioned, we had funds that went through 2014-2015. Uh, they're in a no-cost extension right now. And these are the, excuse me, these are the ones that are being funded right now. So these are the 18 projects in-house for us, how much money was allocated, what they're sending to us in match, the PI's name, and their affiliation. So any of these 55, 56 projects, send me an email. I'll scoot out the five Excel spreadsheets for you and have at it. Um, and, and hopefully that will um, build some partnerships and let you know who's doing what in what space. So with that, I, I can pause. That's about you know, 20 minutes left here. I can pause and ask if there's any questions about that kind of research portfolio and extension. And if there are any questions right now, I'd be happy to run through a couple slides that just show you what the island looked like. But I don't want to take time away from questions related to research just to show you some eye candy. So I'm happy to kind of pause here and see if there's any questions. Yeah, please try. <laughs> Round three. Round three, absolutely. So we've got money in hand. Um, the RFP will roll out probably at the end of this month, maybe a little later. Um, it'll be driven again by agency priorities but we've separated some of them out. So ag's priorities are separated because they've identified a region of the state where they're doing BMP, you know, incentivizing farmers to put BMPs. And so we're going to do a call for about $500,000. We'll go to researchers that can do edge of field work on top of those BMPs. Another million is being set aside for EPA health and DNR, their priorities. And then always in these RFPs, we often say, and whatever else you want to do. Because what we found is that these agencies have ideas of what their priorities are, but we've seen proposals come in that didn't match those priorities, and as that advisory board were reviewing them, saying, we didn't even know you can do this, right? So it wasn't on their priority because they didn't know the capacity already existed. So the priorities are there, but they're not forced to be in those priorities. So there's another 1.5 that's 
being transferred from ODAG to us right now. It's committed. We got it. We've just got to run the RFP on it. And to let you know, I don't know how it'll go through. We're going through our state budget process right now, but there are discussions to put in two other $2 million chunks um, in um, FY17 and 18. So we're hoping that you know, the state, at least Ohio, you know, has recognized, and I know Michigan and Indiana have also, have recognized that this is a critical issue. That we need to be addressing. But round three is for sure. Four and five are still in the, the budget discussion. I thought there was an answer question over here. No? Good, Tim. Yeah, for the uh, tracking microsystems in real time, that's for dissolve phase only, correct? Correct, correct. So when, yeah, so when you get cell lysis, you know, but depending on where, so that's what you're talking about, whether it's in cell or, 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 or lysed, yeah. So it depends on where in that treatment train you are, right? If you do it in raw water, it's only going to get that that's in the water. But then when you bring it in the treatment plant and you, of course, lyse the cells, you could see a spike off of that test. Um, last time we had it sit down with Dr. Wulu, they were getting down um, at very tiny concentrations where we need them to get max concentrations. So they're doing the dilution work right now because, you know, Tiny is not what that water treatment plant wants to know because they're adjusting their treatment based on how heavy the load is. And so that's what's going on right now is taking um, that and ramping it up. All right, well, let me show you some pictures. If you think of another question, that'd be great. So this is, this is uh, Gibraltar Island. Um, so that's the six and a half acre island. The town and all the docks you're seeing, that's Putin Bay. So if you've ever heard of Putin Bay or South Bass Island. And then we do have some South Bass Island buildings in that box on the top um, left. A little closer view, there's a, our research building is in the, is the bottom left, along with our aquatic visitor center is the brick building. That's where we have our education and outreach. And the other box is showing you our classroom building. So that's where all, all the courses are offered. Um, so there's a lot of space there, but there are professor offices also on that. I can use my pointer here if I'm in the right place. Um, on that South Bass facility, this is a cottage for researchers and a cottage for researchers here. And so if you come up and you have a need to be there for a week or a month or three months, let us know, and we have housing capabilities for you. That's our main office. That's running year-round. Even when the ferries aren't running, our staff are then stranded on an island, so they're a very captive audience. Um, that's our, again, left is the research building, and right is the aquatic visitor center. So this is, used to be an old DNR fish hatchery. We run it as an education center now. This has a wet lab in it, which I'll show you in a little bit. And I want to show you this because that's a lot of green space, but it's owned by the university. So I'm always looking to find ways to build either new lab space or new living quarters for visiting research. Up close vision, again, that's the research building. You're seeing three of our vessels parked out front. I'll give you closer views of those, and that's the Aquatic Visitor Center. This is the research building. It was just uh, repainted recently. This used to be the inside back in, like, 2012. We actually had heavy equipment in there to rip out all the floors, and this is what it looks like now. Okay? In the floor drains, we've got, you know, circular flow-through tanks. Um, that microcystin in flesh, tish, tissue of fish flesh, the problem with that project, um, not problem, but the limitation with that is when you're harvesting the fish out of the lake, you don't know if they were in a bloom for three months or were they in a bloom for three days. And so the idea is to bring those fish into the lab, run a flow-through system of a known concentration of microcystin, and do the same analysis. Um, so that can all happen in this facility. Water quality lab inside here, if any of you know of Dr. Justin Chaffin, he's our research coordinator. This is his, his lab. Um, so that was recently renovated in, I think, uh, 13 or 14. There's the Aquatic Visitor Center, so some quick photos of inside. We're trying to get rid of the, the, uh, the primary color displays here that are ancient and remodel this place and get some funds in there to do some um, upgrades. But that's our Aquatic Visitor Center. This is one of our four larger vessels, so our 42-foot RV uh, Gibraltar III. This used to be an old DNR vessel um, before we took it over from them. This is the Biolab 37-footer, um, oldest research vessel in the Great Lakes, uh, 1947. So this is needing to be falling off our inventory as far as research purposes, but it's great for our field trips and our outreach events. RV monitor, uh, RV Erie monitor, 27-foot aluminum, and the GS3. You may have seen this one before. This used to be an Ohio Department of Natural Resources vessel in their geological survey unit, and they recently transferred that to Sea Grant Stone Lab for research purposes. Shock boats that are on the islands, if that's something that is a need for folks. We do have other small uh, Boston whalers for quick uh, water sampling. So, again, give us a call. Hey, we've got a satellite imagery that shows a bloom in this place. Can you get out there and grab me a sample? Give us a call, and we'll get out there and grab it. Um, basically, from West Sister all the way to Lorraine Point, we have pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good mobility. Again, here's our classroom building. We now have solar panels on the island, 90 panels, eight different styles or types based on inverters and optimizers. 
This used to be the bottom floor of that classroom. We did get some funding um, in 2011-12. Now it looks like this, drop ceilings, power, um, new scopes, things like that. Conference center, conference room, conference space there. Again, solar panels, students out underneath those solar panels. Um, again, uh, there's the island. Those are all the solar panels together, 90 of them. Full functioning dining hall. So when the students come, they're eating on the island. So full dining hall. There is a dormitory here. Um, so during college courses time, we can, we can house about 48 students. But in off season, which is basically August, September, and October, this building is for the most part empty. Um, we have field trip groups that come up, but we can get some space in here for researchers and graduate students. Um, there is housing for our staff on the island, um, our full-time summer staff, but there is also faculty housing, which we can use for researchers. There's eight units in here. Each one has its own ensuite bathroom. This is a research facility, so this is called Barney Cottage. Again, full capability to house researchers for a long period of time. And if you didn't know, we have a National Historic Landmark. So OSU on that island owns a castle. This is Cook's Castle, built in 1960, or I'm sorry, 1864. It's a, as I said, a National Historic Landmark. Right now, it's it's gutted, so it fell into disrepair, and so we're trying to fundraise to to renovate this for a conference center or a meeting space. Um, but pretty amazing structure. Uh, Cook was a financier of the Civil War, and that's where he made all his money. Many of you are aware of this. We do have weather stations on top of this castle, but we're able to put equipment up there. So if you want to get some equipment out on that island, let us know, and we can put it there. Um, we also, Ohio State owns and operates South Pass Island Lighthouse, um, so you're aware of that. That's a NOAA tower in the background. Um, that's SB1, I think, is the number for that, South Pass Island 1. That's where that weather station is. If you don't know, I know we're a lot of Michigan fans in here, but that's Gordon Gee there. Um, the, a, the I and OHIO. Um, so with that, those are just some pictures of, again, the capacity that's there. Um, we see anywhere between 30 and 50 researchers on the island during the course of a summer, somewhere in there. Um, but we'd always love to have more heads and beds. And so if you've got a problem or if there's a question in the lake that you need to address and you need that location, give us a call. And we'll get vessel time available for you, water quality lab time available for you, flow through tanks. Um, housing, things like that. So really, we want to be a, a great partner going forward. So let us know what needs you have of us from a research standpoint. And if we can help on the outreach education side, please let us know too. So I can pause with there about facility discussions or any questions would be great. We have a question online. First question is, is the edge of the field work starting before the BMP is initiated? So this isn't, there's other stuff going on in Ohio. Uh, Greg Labarge with uh, USD NRCS is doing some edge of field where they're actually measuring surface runoff and tile runoff before and after BMP placement. A lot of this stuff based on um, some of those practices have been in place for a while. So not all of it is baseline and then reduced measurement. Where we can get that, that's the IOD situation, but I wouldn't say 100% of our edge of field work is pre and post. The second question is, um, eutrophication seems to also alter the ecosystem in lakes. How sensitive is the algae in Lake Erie now in response to the input of pea loadings? In other words, how likely can HABs happen in lower pea loading in the future? So all the work that I've been seeing, and, and there's, there's experts here in the audience that can answer this as well, if not better than me for this, we're not seeing a lot of internal loading within Lake Erie. So when you have a heavy rain event, which means a heavy influx of nutrients, you're going to see a corresponding large bloom. But then we've had years like 2011 was a wet year, huge bloom. Until 2015, it was our record bloom. But 2012 was a drought year, and the, the bloom was negligible. And the same thing again, 15 was the wettest year on record, largest bloom. 16, when we just left, low rainfall, no bloom. Um, and we've seen work when, when Erie was the uh, CSMI lake, so the Cooperative Science and Monitoring Lake. So they do a rotation across the five lakes. When Erie was in 2014, there was many projects going hand in hand to look at that internal loading and also look at that internal loading in relationship to projected climate changes. And what we're actually showing is that unless you get drastic warming of the lake, um, that internal loading will be, I think the numbers were like four or six percent. Tim, maybe you can echo, I think that was about the number four to six maybe from internal loading. It was very low. And so if you don't have that nutrient input primarily associated with, with the water influx, um, the blooms will, will, will be measurably less. So. 
Brad, please. Can you give me a, a high-level overview of other things you guys are focusing on besides harmful algal blooms? Yeah, so good. Thanks for bringing that. I feel like I eat, sleep, drink harmful algal blooms, and I came up as a fish squeezer. So I'm like, thanks. Good. Yeah. Let's talk. So we're still doing fish recruitment stuff. So we look at, you know, we've seen correlation. A lot of this comes out of, like, the aquatic ecology lab, Stu Ludson and that team, that correlations between the severity of winter and, and the strength of the hatch. So we do look a, a little bit at that kind of stuff. We still have our hands in invasive species stuff, so what are we going to see with Asian carp moving into the system? Um, so that's some of the stuff we work on. Another issue for um, from Ohio and the Ohio agencies is, is dredging, right? Not only do we have a 40% reduction in nutrient loading by 2025, it's supposed to be no open lake dumping by 2020. And so we're looking at really how can we figure out what we can do with that dredge material. So, um, you know, the beneficial reuse, figuring out what we do with that. Um, we do a lot of coastal resilience stuff, so really going in with communities and helping them talk about where they should grow as far as in floodplains or getting out of those floodplains and figuring out how they can build resilient marinas so we can battle things like superstorm standee that, that come through. The space that I don't think we're in enough right now um, is uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products. So that's one that I'd really like to start um, moving in. Our request for proposals for Ohio Sea Grant will leave hopefully this week. Um, I was hoping it would go out tomorrow, maybe Thursday. But as that goes out, because this money's coming from ODHE and from that Field to Faucet initiative, we have a lot of projects in play for nutrients and, and HABs. So our focus area you'll see for Ohio Sea Grants proposal is to focus on things like dredging, fisheries, um, pharmaceuticals, and personal care projects. So we're really trying to take that 500,000-ish, sometimes it's closer to 400,000 that we give out annually, to be on projects that are, again, as you asked in your question, outside of the HAB nutrient loading area. But that's kind of the work that we're doing in, in that space. Any other final questions? What do we do? Coming up. Oh, what did I say that was inflammatory? Uh-oh. We will follow up with another HABS question. Is there any research or information on why the 2014 bloom, which was the fourth most severe bloom between 2011 and 2015, caused the water crisis in Toledo? Yeah, so the water crisis in Toledo, and again, there's a lot of experts here. That was kind of one of those, let me use the phrase, per perfect storm. But it went from no bloom to a bloom very quickly. That bloom was also pretty concentrated as far as toxic. It wasn't the most toxic, toxic we've seen, but it had toxic. But as soon as that bloom rolled out of that bay, the wind shifted towards out of the northeast. So it really kind of held that bloom right over the top of that water intake. And if you're not familiar with the Western Basin of Lake Erie, and I know most people in here are, it's a pretty shallow system. So when you get a nor'easter and you hold that bloom where it's at, you're going to be mixing those toxins from the surface down into that intake. And we've seen that, that treatment plants have the ability to remove that level of toxins that were pulled into the plant. It's really our ability to give that early warning system and have the right tools and technologies in those treatment facilities to remove that toxin. So um, that's primarily the driver for 14 and why Toledo had that 72-hour that issue. We'll do one quick answer question and then the other questions I will email them to you Chris Absolutely. and with the, the person who sent them. Uh, the quick answer question will be will an evaporation station be placed at the castle or is there already one there? There isn't one there. Bring it on. Absolutely. <laughs> we have, I, I'll have to run that by the, the some of the staff because I keep throwing things for them to, to keep an eye on or to even monitor and they get a little frustrated with them. It's like you know, it's like, I don't think I fed my pets before I left the house this morning. So the more things that we have to watch, the harder it gets. But we have a, a, a weather station um, for the USGS that we help them maintain. And we have an atmospheric mercury monitor from the EPA that's on the island. I think that's one of like two dozen atmospheric mer mercury monitoring devices measuring at parts per quadrillion. When the garbage truck goes by, you'll, you'll pick a spike up off the garbage truck um, just from it going, going by. Um, so those are the kind of devices, again, we're in a great location. And so anything we can do to help out your research portfolio by just being a chunk of land to put something on, let us let us know. Um, but we'd love to talk about that, that arrangement for sure. Hey, before we thank Chris, uh, one last time, a couple quick announcements. So Chris is going to be uh, in individual meetings for about roughly the next two hours. If we didn't get you on the schedule and you really want to be, let Tom or I know and we'll work you into some sort of uh, group meeting with Chris. And then at 4.30, we're going to take him out for a beer at Salt. That is um, the old church down uh, in Saline that was converted to a restaurant and brewery. So feel free to join us at 4.30, uh, talk with Chris a little bit more. 
Uh, I hope you really enjoyed this talk. Uh, we've got, a, I think, a very productive new partnership brewing with, with OSU. Uh, Siler, the Cooperative Institute for Limnology and Ecosystem Research, is morphing towards a, a much stronger regional consortium, and I see OSU playing a key part of that in the future. And so I hope you saw something that really interested in you that could benefit NOAA and its research programs. Uh, join me in thanking Chris for a nice talk. Thank you.